Ok, pues, hola, 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 gente. Hola, amigos. Um, es un honor estar aquí hoy para hablar. Um, he preparado mis slides en español, pero voy a continuar mi charla en inglés hoy. Es mi esperanza que el próximo año puedo dar una charla más de 20 minutos en español, pero hoy voy a continuar en inglés. Discúlpame. <laughs> um, so the name of the talk today is Lo que hablo cuando hablo de Python, diversidad, inclusión y comunidad en Python. What I talk about when I talk about Python, diversity, inclusion, and community in Python. You've already got a little of an introduction to me. My name is Lorena Mesa, and I do a few things with Python, including that I am an organizer with PyLady Chicago. I am a director and chairperson, or la presidenta, me, me encanta este titulo, la presidenta, <laughs> of the Python Software Foundation. Uh, I use Python in my day job with GitHub, and I often use Python as a language when I'm talking about ethics and technology. Uh, for anyone who would like to chat, you can find me on most places on the web with the handle Lorena Nicole. I'm going to go ahead and there we go. Let's see if that slide gets through. It looked like it was a little slow. Okay. Anyways, uh, all joking aside, when I sat down to, to write this talk, one of the things that came to mind for me was thinking a bit about imposter syndrome. For those of you who may not know what imposter syndrome is, it's that feeling of anxiety, the feeling of inadequacy, where you're really just judging yourself and having a lot of self-doubt. So when thinking about what I could possibly share with you all in this amazing community, talking about open source, talking about coding, I really wasn't sure where to start. And one of the things that I began to think a little bit about was thinking about how myself as a person, I'm very, very goal oriented. As a marathoner, I often find that when I talk to people about why I run marathons, and I've, written, I've ran 15 marathons now, which is quite a big thing if I start thinking about how many marathons I've ran, I often talk about this author that you can see on the left-hand side, this book called What I Talk About When I Talk About Running. And this book by the author, Japanese author Haruki Murakami, what he often talks a lot about is having motivation and really thinking about what motivates you. And one of the things that I kept... Yeah. Okay. Sure. Excellent. Let's do that. Gracias, Miguel. So, estoy aquí en slide four. Perfecto. Okay. Uh, if we can go to, yeah, that, that's a good place to start. So thanks friends for that help. So when I began thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about today, specifically about Python, I really started to ask myself, what is Python to me? And what do I tell people when I start telling people about my origin story with Python? And the first thing that came to my mind is actually thinking about where I'm from, Chicago. Next slide, please. And with Chicago, for many of you who may not know where uh, know much about Chicago, there's probably one thing you know about Chicago, which is it is affectionately known as the Windy City. I was saying to Luis when we first were talking backstage a little bit about how it's already starting to get very, very cold here, hence a little bit of the cough that you may hear in my throat. But Chicago is a fantastic city. It's a city known for many things, including the first skyscraper, which was built in 1884, uh, the first Ferris wheel, if that's of any importance to you, and also deep dish pizza, which I don't think 
any Chicagoan really eats, but it's something that people think about. Also, I think the other thing that people think about when they think about Chicago, thank you, they think a lot about the weather. <laughs> So when I tell you it's starting to get cold here, these are some images from what was called, and I do not even know how to say this in Spanish, so I didn't try, uh, the polar vortex, which if you can take a look at some of these images in 2019, what you can see is an aerial view of Chicago where you can see that there's these frozen sheets of ice just everywhere through the city, including on the top right-hand side, there's people who were dressed in ski attire to make sure they weren't actually getting frostbite because of how cold it was outside. And if you look then on the right-hand side, the image with the fire, our public trains, we had to actually keep the ice off the train tracks. The way we did that was literally by setting the train tracks on fire. So why am I talking about Chicago? And next slide, please. You know, I might be talking about Chicago because I really want you all to enjoy the great weather wherever you are in, in LATAM. <laughs> or maybe, next slide, please. Or maybe I'm talking about Chicago a lot because there's just so many fun things that can happen. When you have a hundred degree change in the span of 38 hours as we had on January 30th, 2019. This video, which I won't play today, was it shows water that is boiling and you fling it into the air, immediately turns into, uh, turns into uh, a steam of cloud and is frozen. It's pretty, pretty interesting. But all of that to say, when I talk about Chicago, Chicago is the start of where I began as a technologist. Next slide, please. Specifically, as a Chicagoan, my background is one of many places. I have family roots in Mexico, Cuba, Spain, and all of my family eventually made Chicago their home. In 2009, I graduated with a degree in mathematics and political science from Northwestern University. At that time, there was, the, like right now, a big political campaign happening in my country. Specifically, there was a movement that was circulating at this time that captured the imaginations of many young people. And what was that movement? It was the movement that was titled Change We Can Believe In. Specifically, working on the Obama campaign, something that was very, very groundbreaking about that campaign was the prominent use of technology in helping us develop outreach strategies helping us come up with sophisticated tools for how we could have predictive analytics help us understand if we were going to be likely to win or not. And the ways that we did a lot of this is we actually used something very unique at the time, which was called data science. Next slide, please. One area where we actually started applying a lot of these kind of tactics included doing very targeted personalized outreach. Specifically, one of the specifically I worked on the Latino vote part of the campaign. And for those folks that identify as Latino or Latinx in the United States, that does have a very, very broad umbrella of what that may mean to you. As we know, when we talk about Latin America, there's many rich identities and communities. And that richness is also captured in the United States from the many folks who have relocated to my country. Something that I always think of when I think of the Latinos for Obama work is I tend to think of how my grandfather, who is from Piedras Negras, which is right along the border, he one thing he always would tell me is, Mija, we didn't move, the border moved on us, specifically calling out that at one point, the part of the, the southern part of Texas, where part of my family is from, actually once was a part of Mexico. And one of the things that I think my, my abuelo wanted me to understand was that change is constant and understanding change is going to be something that's important for you in whatever work you do. Next slide, please. So with the 
Obama for America 2008 campaign, we were pulling data from all kinds of non-traditional sources like social media. And we were using that data to help us build models to target and interact with these key demographic audiences, such as the Latinos for Obama uh, uh, states where we were working with folks from Florida, we were working from folks with Texas, Colorado, and Arizona were our four key states. Some of the skills that were necessary for us to work on this campaign included doing predictive analytics. As I mentioned, we were thinking about such questions like, given this voter percentage turnout, how likely were we to win? How many more people did we ne need to register to vote in order for us to possibly win the campaign? Other things we were thinking about was sentiment analysis, was our messaging on brand. Lastly, we were always thinking about mapping and trying to understand how to get our assets into the field to meet folks where they were at. All of these types of problems, we were using data science to help us solve these problems. And if there's something that you all may know about data science is that data science draws from a whole bunch of skill sets, including mathematics, programming, and deep subject area expertise. However, as the sole intern and staffer based in Chicago, where the headquarters was for the Latino Vote team, I was really trying to figure out how it was I could do all of this work and uh, use my skills to help actually move the campaign forward with our blueprint for the Latino Vote part of the campaign. Next slide, please. I actually ended up finding my answer by, by starting to use a programming language called Python. See, in Chicago, there is a very, very active and robust user group called Chicago Python User Group, which we call Chippy, as in English, the chipmunk, which is our mascot, sounds a little bit like Chippy, so it's kind of this cute name we, we use. But by participating in my local user group, I was able to start asking questions and start figuring out how I could start doing some of this statistical analysis that I was used to doing either by hand or with other tools such as SAS or R, a different, another programming language that I had some background in. Next slide, please. So rather than, so, Early on in my life, actually Python came into my world because I actually found that there was this rich user group all around me and I had a specific passion of where I wanted to apply my programming skills and that was to help bring about political change that I believed in. So when I begin thinking about this question, what do I talk about when I talk about Python? I do tend to think about Chicago, but another story that I think about when I talk about Chicago and my Python skills. Next slide, please. I tend to think about a city of my home city, Chicago, as one that has unfortunately been a city carved out by many historical processes that have led to Chicago becoming one of the most segregated cities in the United States of America. Unfortunately, the last 40 years, the rich have continued to get richer, the poor have continued to get poorer, and the middle class has continued to leave to the suburbs. Additionally, as you can see with this map on the right-hand side of Chicago, what you can see is that there's been great segregation between folks of different ethnicities and racial backgrounds. Broadly speaking, the north side of Chicago is the more wealthy part of the city where there's more infrastructure, more access to healthcare, more access to equitable transportation and just in general is a safer part of Chicago. Whereas if you look on the South side or the Southwest side, where you have more of the black community or the Latin or the Latino community in Chicago, these have historically been areas where there has not been enough investment. Next slide, please. Timing the fact that Chicago has this backdrop of being a city of, of many lived experiences determined by, depending where you live, unfortunately, that tends to be associated with one's ethnic and racial identity, as well as also having a connection to there being investment or not in your neighborhood. In 2017, former Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel announced this new initiative 
in his attempt to try to confront the the city of Chicago's continued problem with violence of using a new technique called predictive policing. And when he talked about predictive policing, he was very clear that pr these p predictive policing strategies would be used and particularly focused on the south and southwest sides of Chicago. Now, I just finished telling you about how Chicago is a segregated city, how the north is largely whiter, more wealthy, whereas the South and Southwest side is more populated by the Latin population and by the Black population, and unfortunately is also the part of the city that does not have as, as much investment. It, the, south, the South side of Chicago also has historically been the part of the city where there has been an abundance of over-policing. Next slide, please. This movement into predictive policing and the city of Chicago's mayor talking about using these predictive measures is something that was not received very comfortably by the city of Chicago. Many people were very concerned about over-policing. In fact, I was one of those people that was very disturbed by the idea that we can use technology to regulate a city that already is suffering from trust, is already suffering from a lack of investment. And one of the ways that I decided that I wanted to get involved was by, again, looking to a user group in my city called Shy Hack Night, which is a group that is broadly invested in civic technology. For those of you who may not know what civic tech is, civic tech is the idea that we can use technology to help us build tools where the government may fall short, helping us to build tools to maybe uh, help provide services that the city is not providing or to do research and analysis on questions that need to be answered. Specifically, I was contributing to a project by the Chicago Justice Project, which was disappearing, which was investigating the disappearances of more than 7,000 people that had been arrested in Chicago. However, these people were disappeared during the time of their arrest. And something that was additionally disturbing was most of these people that were not being tracked during their time held by the Chicago Police Department. Overwhelmingly, these were people of color. The investigation into police misconduct and the consistent abuse of individuals' rights required us in the, in the civic tech community to have to continue to request Freedom of Information Act, which is something in my country we have that allows us to obtain public records on data that government agencies had. It required us to have to build tools with, again, using a lot of different technologies, but predominantly I was using Python as I was doing data analysis to scrape data whenever we could from public data sets around arrests. And what we found with all of this work was eventually we were able to start demonstrating a systematic bias towards, pe towards people of color and their treatment tended to be one that was overly problematic by the Chicago Police Department. And by us demonstrating this bias, we actually were able to get the bigger media involved. The UK publication, The Guardian, actually picked up our research and started doing an expose highlighting this abuse in the Chicago Police Department and started talking about racial inequity. And at the heart of all of this work that we were doing was Python. Next slide, please. So if the, as if that wasn't enough, so that was 2017. In 2018, the issues with public trust between Chicago Police Department and Chicago continue to be one that was very, very stressed. Specifically in 2018, there was a very public trial about the murder of a young black man named Laquan McDonald. Laquan McDonald was shot 13 times and killed. His death was captured on camera and it was a very, very public and contentious issue for the city of Chicago. Not only was that a very public trial that was happening in 2018, again, around policing, but around the same time, a report from the American Civil Liberties Union, a 
group that does investigation to make sure that the rights of people living in the United States is not being are not being violated. They came out with a report citing the unconstitutional use of social media um, management software and how that software was actually being abused and so and sold to the Chicago Police Department. Specifically, the, co the companies that were named were companies that were helping the Chicago Police Department track activists. In fact, their marketing material went so far as to show the police department how to follow such hashtags as I can't breathe, don't shoot. All of this discussion with social media and with the social media ab abuse that was being sold, specifically the software being sold to the uh, Chicago Police Department, something I discovered was the company I worked for at the time was actually named in this, in this brief. And I had to then have a very hard conversation with myself. Next slide, please. I had to start thinking about ultimately what was my what was my purpose of what I wanted to do as a technologist. See, my story and how I got involved in technology began with such a positive and uplifting message. I was actually working in campaigns that helped me build the change that I wanted to see around me. But then as an engineer, I was finding the tools that I was building were actually causing more harm than good. And it was a very difficult one for me to think about, about what I wanted my impact in the world to be. This photo is of Mark Zuckerberg, which I imagine many of you know who that is, the founder of Facebook. And whenever I think about our impact as technologists and what we can do, I think of this photo right here. This is a photo taken when Mark Zuckerberg was being investigated by the United States Senate and they were asking about Facebook's position on how they were understanding election violation and what Facebook did or did not do to minimize the election interference of the 2016 presidential campaign. Not shown in this photo, Mark Zuckerberg was actually on a pillow because <laughs> I guess the angle was a little low, but I want you all, as you think about what kind of work you can get involved with, involved in and what open source can do. There's definitely a lot of impact in open source for good, but we need to be intentional about, and we need to be intentional in thinking about what we want to do and how we do it. Next slide, please. So in thinking about open source, open source is an, a fantastic way for many of us to get involved and support the communities that we love. But at the same time, open source has a sense of accountability and there's a strong, there's a big importance to it. And one way I, I encourage people to think about this topic is to think about it from the perspective of responsible technology or technology that thinks about ethics. Specifically, when I talk about Python and I talk about what Python can do, how Python can help us take an image of a black hole or how Python helped me make change in my local community by doing research with a local user group for us starting a dialogue around police, around policing and us thinking about what policing ought to look like. I also then encourage people to think about ethical technology. Technology itself is not neutral. And there's three ways you can think about this. You can think about it as the ethics of data. That is how it is our data is created and shared and how it is consumed and used in our technology. We can think about the ethics of algorithms. That is humans write algorithms, as we all know. This is actually a very popular discussion right now as we think about maybe face surveillance and how face surveillance is not exactly the best implementation since it's working on flawed data sets. And we have seen that there's bias in how face surveillance works when it is a part of a policing strategy. We can think about ethics as ethics of practice. And this right here, I think is something that open source can really benefit from because it is our practices that actually teach one another what the community ought to look like and what our sense of accountability is to one another. Next slide, please. 
And there's some ways that when we talk about ethics of practice that some people have, and practitioners have thought about this. Within my, um, within my country, one way that people have thought about this is thinking about an ethical code or an ethical creed. There's a group called Data for Democracy and they've started kind of thinking about what would it mean to take the Hippocratic Oath that is an oath that medical professionals take when they say that they will uphold and practice their medical profession to the best of their ability, what would that look like for us as technologists? Another way that we can think about the ethics in our world around us is not only just the ethics of some kind of oath, but just what are our collective shared values? Next slide, please. So what do I talk about when I talk about Python? I talk about home. I talk about how I got started with my, my work as a technologist and how all that work was powered by open source. I talk about what it means to me to have a sense of accountability and what that accountability means when I'm invested in technology, when I'm invested in, op in open source. But one of the other things I think about when I talk about Python, I think about the community. Next slide, please. There is a lot of dialogue around Python and its quote unquote incredible growth. Many of you may have seen this graphic with Stack Overflow specifically pointing out how Python has grown um, in such popularity with them in 2017 saying that Python, the tag Python increased in usage by 27%. That's just one year alone. And why has Python grown so much? Um, I think some of the stories I've told you about the work that I have done, it's very easy to use. It, it's open source. It can be used to educate one another. It has a very rich standard library. There's so there's a lot of use cases. So we can so Python has grown a lot because it is inherently an, a nice language. It's it's an, it's an easy language to get started with, and its broad use cases makes it applicable to more than one one use case. The other part of that conversation with Python's growth, every year the Python Software Foundation, we in tandem with uh, JetBrains have done this Python developer survey where we start asking how it is that Python's used, what is it you're using it for? And what we continue to find is that the growth of Python is also being largely fueled by two big things are being marked as the primary use case for Python, data analysis, and web development. Of course, there's also primary use cases such as in DevOps or machine learning, but we find that people are using Python a lot to help them do some type of broader, more applied problem solving. Next slide, please. So Python's growth has been instrumental and not only has the usage of how Python um, shifted over years, but also the impact around the world has really changed a lot. With the Python Software Foundation, every year we release an annual report of the work that our community is doing. And one of the things the Python Software Foundation does is we have a grants program. And as you can see, the program that uh, our grants program has funded activities all around the world. So from 2019 alone, we have seen a, a big growth of Python uh, grants in Africa at 26%. And we've seen a lot of growth in other places, for example, like South America. I would like to see that number higher in the future, but we've seen just, again, the global growth of Python continuing to explode. Next slide, please. In fact, in 2018 alone, our, our grants program went and helped fund initiatives in 51 countries or approximately 324,000 US dollars, which was a growth of 22.6% more than in 2017. Next slide, please. So in thinking about Python and what I talk about when I talk about Python, when we think of our community, we really need to be able to real meet our community where they are at. Our community is no longer just predominantly folks in the US, in the United States, or in Europe. Our community is increasingly in Latin America, is increasingly in Africa. The next billion people coming online are coming from these other places. As we all know, the, 
the growth in Latin America is so exciting and so awesome. And one way that we are really trying to make sure we're meeting our community is particularly done through the work with the Python Software Foundation. If you've not heard of the Python Software Foundation, our mission is found on our website and explicitly we, we are dedicated to promoting and protecting and advancing the language. But, I, and this is the most important part in my opinion, is, is also to encourage the growth of a globally diverse and international Python community. Next slide, please. So ways that we do that is multifold. One, one way that we do that is that we have a legal, uh, is that the Python Software Foundation has a, a legal arm to it. The Python Software Foundation actually owns the trademark for Python and helps oversee any trademark issues or, in, or any intellectual property issues that we may have. If you are one of the official projects of the Python Software Foundation, you actually also have access to our legal uh, our legal representatives so that you can have that support if you have questions around trademarking or other such things. The big initiative here for us with Python and us having a legal strategy is to make sure that we continue to keep it free and open for all to use. That is a huge, huge value to us. Next slide, please. As I've mentioned, another part of the way that we help facilitate and grow this international and diverse community is through also supporting our members and their and our community members where they are at. So we do this with also a grants program. Obviously, 2020 is an interesting year as there is a there is a brote, there's a pandemic right now. So we're not meeting one another in the same way. However, and when we do reach that in the future, as the world will in the future get to a place where we can once again congregate and meet and talk and spend time together. The grants program is one way that we help, we help make sure that we're supporting our community. For example, you may see these two examples of, of grants we've given in the past. Uh, for example, this program in East Africa, where we have an ambassador program, where we support outreach in various areas around the world. Or for example, we have this grant that went to go fund a workshop that happened in Monterrey, Mexico in June, 2019. Our grants program support in-person experiences, support developer sprints. If you were considering doing a Python sprint and you might need some fiscal support, that's exactly what this program is meant for. Next slide, please. And then all of that to say that the other part of which, of how the PSF tries to help meet the community where it's at and facilitate a globally diverse community is that we have a board of directors who are community members that are voted in to help advise the Python Software Foundation. Our directors actually come from Africa, Australia, Europe, and North America. I would love to see us have, have more directors coming from the from Latin America. Unfortunately, we do not currently have a, have a board member from Latin America, but our election happens every year and directors are voted in for a three year term. So if you're ever thinking about wanting to help guide the vision of what the Python Software Foundation ought to look at and what they ought to work on, this is another opportunity to help do that. Next slide, please. And then lastly, with the Python Software Foundation, we've got multiple membership opportunities. You can join as a basic member. You can join as a supporting member. Um, we've got two types of memberships that if you're doing open source work already, be it you run a meetup group or you actually contribute to a Python open source project, you can actually register under one of those two a managing member or a contributing member, and you only need to work about five hours a month. That is, by the way, self-certified. We trust you to evaluate what membership makes most sense. So another way you can get involved is by being a member. Next slide, please. So with the Python Software Foundation, we really are really hoping to have as many people be involved. There's multiple opportunities. The big thing for us when we think about 
what our mission is. We can only accomplish this mission if we are working together, thinking about what does the future of our community look like. Next slide, please. There's many ways you can get in touch with us. I think perhaps the best way you can read more is by going to python.org. And from there, you can read about the PSF at the PSF desk landing. Also, you can reach out to us on, so on social media. We're pretty active there as well. Next slide, please. So what I talk about when I talk about Python, I really talk about many things. I talk about home, I talk about social change, I talk about open source and how open source has allowed me to build my career, to build a meaningful career that allows me to do the work that I want and be the change I wanna see in the world. But another thing that I, the, the biggest thing I talk about is community. Next slide, please. From old communities, many new ones are born. This, is a, uh, this was my original mentor who helped me when I started my work with Python back over 10 years ago on the Obama campaign. Unfortunately, Tanya passed away last year, but it's the mentorship and the, con the human connections that inspired me to get more involved, inspired me to want to continue to, to give back. Next slide, please. And another way that we're thinking about how we continue to invest more in our community and build a more diverse and inclusive community is by making sure we are listening to the community. So with the Python Software Foundation elections, we opened up a dialogue on discourse earlier this year, on discuss earlier this year to talk about reform, specifically to talk about how we can have more folks from around the world participate, um, we can do term limits and other such things. And we are currently working on implementations for how we can then bring about changes in our next PSF election. Next slide, please. And another way we're doing this work is with Pi Ladies. So Pi Ladies is a group that is for folks of marginalized genders. So folks who may identify as not being a, um, folks who, identify as a marginalized gender, be it you're a woman or you're non-binary, et cetera. We welcome, we welcome all folks. Next slide, please. The biggest thing with pi, with pi ladies is of our over a hundred capital, our, of our over hundred chapters in the world, the biggest growth is not happening in the United States. It's not happening in Europe. It's happening in Central America. It's happening in South America. It's happening in Africa. So what we're seeing with this work is actually we're now investing a lot more in making sure that this initiative of ours actually is meeting people where they are at. Next slide, please. One way we did this was by starting a dialogue with the R community to see how they've set themselves up to have better gender inclusion in their community. Next slide, please. Part of the things we noticed that we were lacking, including included us not having clear ways for there to be a governance model, as well as no real central way to include global members in our space. Next slide, please. So what this kicked off for us was us rethinking about what the future of Pi Ladies ought to be. And for us, the big things we noticed that we needed to invest more in was making sure that we had resources for chapters as well as financial means for our chapters to do this work. Next slide, please. That brought us to actually adopting a new leadership model where we have a leadership team that is voted by our members. And then we have project teams that are open source teams that work on Pilot initiatives. Next slide, please. And I'm excited to say that our global leadership team was just elected. And we have now nine community members that are going to be leading this vision of building Pilot for the future, three of whom come from Latin America, two from Brazil, and one from Mexico. So um, Valerie from Mexico, and then Ana Cecilia and Juliana from Brazil. This kind of work is super instrumental. If you don't change how you allow people to participate and you don't change how people can actually get their foot in the door, nothing changes. Next slide, please. So I encourage you all, be the change that you want to see. Next slide, please. 
So to answer your question and leave you with this thought, what do I talk about when I talk about Python? Next slide, please. I talk about us. And that is the end of my talk. If you go like two or three slides forward, Luis, I do have my contact information on the last slide. Excellent. So I hope I gave you a little bit of a snapshot of the work we're doing in the Python community in multiple fronts to help us make sure we're holding ourselves accountable for building a more equitable, a more diverse, and a more inclusive community. If you would like to continue this talk with me, you can reach me at Lorena at python.org. Again, I'm available on social media, and I thank you all so much for your time today.